I am Michael. I love to recycle. I do it with my bicycle. I do it from my tricycle. I do it in the summertime, or even when there's an icicle. I place it all in a special bin. Plastic bottles, glass, and paper, again and again. Keep them together, rinsed and cleaned. But no plastic bags, please, or you'll damage the machines. So join me and your neighbors. Recycling's no chore. Check out the new website to find out some more. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. My name is Paul Harris and I am president of the City Club's Board of Directors. I am honored and pleased to introduce today's speaker, the Honorable Frank Jackson, Mayor of Cleveland, who today will present his 10th State of the City Address. Now as we've noted in past City Club introductions of Mayor Jackson, and as we consider the significant challenges the Mayor has recently faced, it is worth noting that he is a native son of Cleveland with a lifelong record of service to his city. He attended and graduated from Cleveland Public Schools and earned an associate's degree from Cuyahoga Community College. He completed his undergraduate education at Cleveland State University, where he later earned a master's degree, as well as his law degree from CSU's Marshall College of Law. The mayor today resides in the central neighborhood of Cleveland, where he grew up. Mayor Jackson began his public service career as an assistant city prosecutor in the Cleveland Municipal Court Clerk's Office. Influenced by former Cleveland Councilman Lonnie Burton, Mayor Jackson decided to enter politics and was elected as representative of Cleveland's fifth ward on Cleveland City Council. He served as president of City Council from 2002 to 2005 and took office as Cleveland's 56th mayor on January 2, 2006. 2014 was certainly a notable year in Cleveland with extreme high and low points. The high points included the RNC's selection of Cleveland as a site for its 2016 convention, the extraordinarily successful International Gay Games last August, which by the way demonstrated Cleveland's ability to host a major event, and significant development projects throughout the city. The lowest points included the sad and tragic deaths last November that have, among other things, highlighted the challenges of nurturing effective and productive relationships between the community and the police force. As Mayor Jackson said at a press conference last Friday, those are issues that he's been working on since his early days as a city councilman. Today, Mayor Jackson will comment on those highs and lows and other subjects during the first portion of the program, which will be followed by our traditional city club question and answer period. The format for today's State of the City Address will be a conversation with Beth Mooney, Chair of the Greater Cleveland Partnership. In her daytime job, Ms. Mooney is Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Key Corp, a position she's held since May of 2011. I will now turn the program over to Ms. Mooney. Thank you, Paul. And thank you, Mayor. It is an honor to have the opportunity to play this uh, role this year in the State of the City conversation. And it is a conversation that I think will be punctuated by, as Paul called it, many of the high points and the challenges that we face. But as in all things, we have opportunities. And in all times, we always have the challenges that we need to face as a community. But I think collectively that we can sit here and see much of our progress that I think we're going to leverage for years to come in the, in the great things that are happening around this city. And, and by and large, I feel a sense of optimism, optimism and brightness about our future. When the mayor asked me for the opportunity to um, host a conversation for this year's State of the City, we're gonna, I'm going to share with you, with all of you, the rules of the road we set because they were pretty complicated. Let's sit down. Let's be candid. Let's be direct. Don't be afraid to ask the hard stuff, and let's make sure we leave time for plenty of questions. So, with that high bar we set, um, I'm looking forward to embarking on a conversation. And Mayor, thank you so much for being here today. Well, thank you for being willing to do it. Ooh, we got a reverberation over there. So. I was going to go ahead and start with a level setting question. Um, as Paul said, you've been mayor now since 2006. This right. is your 10th of these uh, formats. 
And let's just talk a little bit about the city through your eyes. You've described that you've kind of had three phases to your right. terms as mayor. That first you had to stabilize the patient. You took office during the financial crisis. Uh, next you talked about how do you build a foundation, and then you've often talked about, and from a foundation, what do you do to start institutionalizing success? So you had the financial crisis, we had the Cleveland plan for the schools. So if I could, how do you see, through your eyes, would you share the state of the city as you sit here today um, in the year of 2015? Well, as, as you mentioned, um, uh, I do view it as three phases. One is uh, stabilization of what was a very challenging time, and it really was a time when we uh, needed to uh, determine direction. But we could not do that until we were stable. Uh, and financial was one of those things, operation, um, uh, those uh, providing the environment for development activity, uh, connecting neighborhoods with prosperity, things like that. Um, once we were able to stabilize it in my first term, the second term was really uh, uh, building on the foundation that we had set and, and doing some things that, that in and of themselves would not be the panacea or the civil bullet that we needed to be successful. But there were things that, that I believe that with, if we did not do them, then, then all of what we had accomplished would be for naught. And my third term is about uh, institutionalizing uh, the best pathway for success. To make it so that regardless of who the mayor is or who has the Greater Clean Partnership, that we as a community uh, behave a certain way in order to be successful and to become a great city. So in, in that respect, I think we are moving in the right direction. We're on that path, uh, very focused in getting there. The education reform was one of the main major components of getting us there. Um, the prosperity around development activity, uh, but the ensuring, and the ensuring that uh, there's a broader equity of who shares in that prosperity, uh, quality of life for which public safety is a key component of. So uh, we're moving that direction, but we're not there yet, but we are moving. And so in that way, I think we're doing quite well. Uh, there are other things that we have challenges on. Uh, those things are, are things around uh, really creating the, inter, the uh, interconnection between prosperity, neighborhoods, and people who live in Cleveland, and having a better connection of that so that uh, we can actually ensure that people have a stake in the game. It's easier for people to be supportive and easier for them to be understand the vision and to be supportive of the vision if they see themselves or their family members, their friends, their community as being the beneficiary of that. And we have some work to do there. Those are some challenges, but we're getting there. Uh, the third is quality of life that deals not only with uh, the services that we deliver, but, uh, but how do we deliver those services? And as was mentioned, uh, our most recent and most publicized challenge with the Department of Justice and, and the Division of Police. Uh, those are things that we're currently facing that we will uh, overcome, that we will resolve, and that we'll continue to move forward. And one final uh, challenge that um, um, someone told me that uh, when you, if you do your job and do it well, people don't always recognize the, the challenges that you have. One of the big challenges that we have is uh, uh, just our budget. We have a $1.3 billion budget, uh, of which $541 million is operations, where we just provide the services to the citizens of the city of Cleveland. Um, that is under challenge now, even though we balance out, and council uh, uh, went through two weeks of hearing, and, and we've done some adjustment in the budget based on their recommendation. Uh, but what we have is a situation where in 2006, when I first became mayor, we had $517 million to operate the general fund. Uh, today, we have $494 million. So you would think in all of this prosperity that I would not be facing the loss of $23 million of continuing revenue. 
Uh, those revenue losses come in many different fashions. Uh, they come from the state uh, cutting a tremendous amount, tens of millions of dollars of support to the cities. Uh, it comes from uh, the impact of the recession that we are still um, uh, under, which is about $18 million of, of uh, property tax loss that is ongoing, and the loss of traffic cameras. Now, when you add those things together, uh, uh, you, we come up to around $60 million. Uh, with that $60 million, we would be structurally balanced, and when you have a structurally balanced budget and some excess, then you could add capacity to add more services, whether it be in safety, building, and housing. But when we have to carry over dollars every year in order to um, support operations, then your ability to expand capacity to deliver service becomes almost negligible. So those, that's the major in the financial way. Even though we're in prosperity, uh, the government uh, of the city of Cleveland has not seen that reflected in our ability to have ongoing revenue to provide the services that, it, that uh, is uh, people demand. Well, then, it, with that context, when you think about this notion of institutionalizing right. that which we see progress or verging on uh, six, being a success, kind of what are then the two or three things that you think about in terms of saying these are the critical things we have to stay the course on how we do things right. if we're going to institutionalize that success? Uh, education. Education is, um, there is no panacea, no silver bullet. But if you made me pick something that I would say is number one, I would say education. Uh, we've made great strides in that area. We're, we have, again, we have not arrived yet, but we're moving in the right direction. And we're creating the kind of partnerships with other systems other than the public school system that really uh, uh, goes towards our focus of quality education. The second major thing is how do we deal with equity? equity in terms of the prosperity and the ability for everyone to share in that prosperity. Of course, education helps, but it's also around uh, how do we uh, uh, create wealth among populations that wealth has not been part of what the opportunity provides them. So how do we do that? And, and how do we ensure that those neighborhoods that have the greatest social economic challenges, uh, how do we create policies, how do we create incentives that will allow for growth there that will lead us to, and, and to the ability to have a, a better prosperity that is shared by everyone. And then finally, it is about uh, quality of life. Uh, people uh, make choices. When, when people have choices, they make choices, and, and a major, area that they make choices in is whether or not they're living in a city, in a neighborhood. They choose to live, work, play, and do business there because of that quality of life. Those are the three things that uh, I'd say are the uh, main focus that we're on and we're going to stay on. Now, one final thing. All this has to be in a context. All it has to be in a context. Other than that, it's just me talking. So uh, it has been a context. And from the beginning to now, I maintain that if we're truly going to be a great city, a great city, a great city that is recognized and used as an example, uh, our greatness will be determined of how we uh, do for the least of us. And again, I uh, constantly um, mention to people that is not about welfare and charity. That is, how do we include everyone into that quality of life, into that prosperity, into the career and choices that you can make because you have a great education and you can make choices in life. So that is what it comes down to. It comes down to people. And it comes down to how you can, uh, how do we operate as a city and how do we institutionalize the operation that is focused on the uplifting of people not in a chair, through charity and welfare, but just through the real opportunity to participate in all of the good things that we do. That is why this DOJ resolution becomes a, a major thing that we have to address now in order to get past this to get 
in order to stay focused on where we need to go. And we'll go to um, where we need to go and the DOJ in just a minute, but let's, let's pause on education because that yeah. is uh, in the second term, the Cleveland plan, which spawned the Transformational Alliance. And you even stated that part of your desire to go for a third term was to stay the course for the right. voters of Cleveland on really getting us to think differently about urban education. Right. Um, and as a business leader, and many of us in here are employers in town and, and in business as well, um, having jobs for our young people is critically important, but having them ready for those jobs so they can participate in this prosperity for all that we need to be achieving, working towards achieving is important. So how would you have us think about the progress of the Cleveland Plan and, and where we are with the state of the schools? Well, let me start off by saying that everything that we've been successful in as a community, we have behaved as a community. We have come together as a community and we have identified that as something, we, a challenge we want to deal with. And every time we do that and we identify that challenge, we come together, we always, we're always successful, always. And, and, and that is what happened with the Cleveland Plan, not only in terms of the uh, state law that we had changed in the, in the collective bargaining agreement uh, that allowed us to uh, do the reforms necessary, but even in the financing of it through a levy, which was a significant levy for the city of Cleveland. So I want to start there to say that that is still in place, that we as a community are still functioning as a community when it comes to education. And, and with that, we have made strides. Uh, uh, now, there are indicators that, um, uh, that are more uh, positive indicators than other indicators. Uh, but at the end of the day, the system is moving forward and is moving forward in the right way. And it's moving forward not just in a way that most people think about it, uh, education. They think about education that we should create a, 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 a workforce. We should create qualified people to be in the workforce, which is good. But I don't think about it that way. Uh, I think about education as educating the whole child, the whole child in a way that that child is not only academically uh, uh, has achieved, but they achieve in terms of the choices they make in life. And they achieve in a way that they blend their experiences of life. And many young people now have far greater experience in a shorter period of time than, than we've had. So they blend that, uh, so it's, it really is how do they interpret their world, their environment, so that they can make good choices and be part of this movement that occurs in Cleveland because they're included in that movement. And, and it just so happens when, when you do that, having a good employee happens. It just happens as a, as a byproduct of, of that, of a good, a well-educated, uh, a, a child that is understanding of their world and can interpret and cope with their world in a way that allows them to be a productive member of society. So in that way, I think we're moving. And, and, um, and I will say also that the, the enthusiasm and uh, um, the morale is better. That now people, uh, when you go into schools, even schools that are still not performing well, uh, people uh, have a different attitude about it. The students do, uh, the teachers do, uh, the parents do. And so there's, there's, a, uh, there's an attitude of, of success here, attitude of progress, which you know makes a tremendous difference. A little spring in the step goes a long way. Oh, oh yes, A little does. spring in the air would go a long way, too. <laughs> um, but with that... I don't know. I might get a pot over, too. But, <laughs> yeah, uh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to Rhodes. We'll get to Rhodes. Um, i keep it cold for a while. <laughs> <laughs> with that, um, I like how you think about, obviously, that we do have to do something to lift up the whole student to have a right. full life. But core to that is the experience they get in the schools. That's correct. So if I could, if you go to the uh, Cleveland Metropolitan School District website, they have a little you know, number of days until the levy has to be renewed. Because a huge piece of the right. ability to have this vision and start bringing it to life is the ability That's to right. have that levy to help transform the schools. 
it fast forward. You're in front of the voters, mm -hmm. like you said, it was a huge piece of your decision to uh, pursue a third term. And I think that's next year. Next year. Mm -hmm. What do you have to see that you want to have happen that you can then look at the voters and say, the levy is worth renewing? Here is why is it's important. What are the success factors that you want to have to support the renewal of the levy? If you talk to the average person, they, they want their child to graduate. They want to see their child graduate. And, and so uh, you have to demonstrate that we're doing a better job to graduate your child. The other thing that they're looking for is a, a better academic experience that they can, they can see in terms of how their child behaves. Uh, many times um, uh, when a child is at home and they have the kind of support they need at home, that translates into the, the schools. And, and so what people are looking for now is to have that child that is educated not just in an academic way, but in a mature maturity way, to have that transferred back into how they behave out on the street, how did they behave. So people look at that uh, things that are not that tangible as part of how they measure this. It, it, is, it is the feeling of whether or not we have progress. Um, uh, and then um, they want the children to be safe. They want the children to be safe. They want to know that if my child goes to school today, that I don't have to worry about my child being in harm's way. And those, I think, are the three major factors that they look at. Graduation, the, the, um, the maturity of the child, and, and how that's reflected, how they can see that, and, and, and that their, their child is safe. Now, when you look at just the empirical data kind of stuff, I mean, I guess you look at third grade reading level, you look at uh, 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 those things that are part of the state report card, whether this school has gone from an F to a D or a C, you look at those kind of things. And the Transformation Alliance, um, which was part of the reform, who oversees the reporting out of, of how our schools are progressing as a whole, each school, and also looks at uh, reviewing uh, whether or not, if a sponsor wants to open up a school here in Cleveland, whether or not they meet the minimum qualifications to do that based on quality. They are the ones who are helping to develop that criteria uh, that is more empirical uh, around where you can actually put on a piece of literature and say, we did A, we did C, we did D, in comparison to before. But uh, in terms of general public, uh, they just want to see their child graduate. They want to see their child behave more maturely, and, and they want to make sure that they're safe. And this is a real quick one. Since we're talking education, give the, the plan for the schools a grade right now. Where are we right now, and, and what grade would you give it? Uh, it depends on the school. Some I would give A plus two. Some of them are still Fs. Uh, some are C's, D's, uh, B's. Uh, what, what we measure it by is what the progress is, the, what they call the value added. What is right. the progress? And, and, and the superintendent has set up what he calls, uh, I forget the name, of, um, the name of the schools, but these are schools that were failing, and then they, they completely reorient re, um, uh, the programming. They, they take teachers out. They have people interview for their jobs, things like that. And so these schools that were, that were failing schools, we're looking at those as real indicators as to how well we're doing in a short period of time. Because um, these are schools that were pretty much dysfunctional, and, and now they have new programming, they have new staffing, they have uh, new uh, direction, things like that. And so you measure those. Now the Transformation Alliance is able to, to follow that to see if in fact they're improving based on um, an apple to apple comparison. All right. Uh, you said there's no panacea and some piece of, uh, for this city to be successful for generations to come. We have to find a way for, to bring all of us along. So mm -hmm. there's much that we can see that's going on in downtown, mm -hmm. lots of progress, lots of visible things happening here. And downtown is now a neighborhood. Right. So uh, give us some of your views on 
uh, what's happening in the neighborhoods outside of perhaps downtown that are critical that have been part of your administration that you think is, is going on in the neighborhoods more generally that's important for that long-term success of the city? Well, uh, uh, neighborhoods are really the core of the city. I mean, they make or break a city. And uh, as you say, downtown is a neighborhood. And, and so I look at downtown not just as a downtown the central businesses. I do look at it as a neighborhood. There are probably about 14,000 people living downtown. Probably in the next couple of years, you might get to 16, 17,000. You know, it's spurring investment beyond just uh, um, the corporate investment. It's spurring investment that you would have when people demand the amenities of a real neighborhood, uh, whether it's a grocery store, uh, public space, those kinds of things. Um, each neighborhood is unique. And each has their, their assets, their valuables, and each has their challenges. And so what we do as a city, we look at each of those neighborhoods and, and ensure that we invest in those neighborhoods in a way that will uh, support the assets and the good things that are happening there and to minimize or get rid of those um, negative things and challenges and, and take them and move them into opportunities. Um, some neighborhoods are easier to do that than others. Uh, um, there's a young man who I've talked to recently and he calls certain neighborhoods consumer neighborhoods where people are consuming a lifestyle. There's a consuming a quality of life. I was just in um, Detroit Shoreway over the weekend the Near West Theater opened, it was open, they had an open house, great investment, people were there, they loved it. Uh, but I can remember 25 years ago when I first got into city council, that was a struggling neighborhood. So now it is a neighborhood that is, is moving forward, but it took some real strategic planning and some consistency and some strategic investment. So we've been able to do that in many of our neighborhoods, east side and west. But now we have neighborhoods that are very challenged in their ability to move ahead based in on a normal way of investment. Uh, example, if, uh, if you invest a dollar downtown in the neighborhood downtown, you get $8 in return. In these um, uh, consumer neighborhoods, the ones that are doing well, you invest a dollar, you might get $3 in return. Other neighborhoods, you invest a dollar, you may get nothing or 50 cents. So the question is, how do we as a city through policy and through partnership with the private sector, how do we create the kind of incentives that would allow for us to have that neighborhood grow and, and take advantage of the assets that they have, which are their people? That's the greatest asset they have, people. And they have certain other things that are physical, but the greatest asset that they have are, are people. So we're investing in people in terms of education, and we're investing in terms of trying to create a, a better uh, sharing of the prosperity. But there's something going on there that stops us, this neighborhood, from, from moving ahead at a much better pace. So what we've done uh, through a $100 million bond issuance, one of the things, we called out $25 million. That $25 million we're gonna use in a way that would provide unique incentives for challenged neighborhoods, where just a regular way of doing things just doesn't work for them. Uh, and, and, and it's not to say that we're going to uh, ignore other places, because we already have programs and dollars that we can use in neighborhoods where you don't have those kind of challenges. But we have to develop uh, uh, policies and mechanisms and some unique tools to help spur the kind of investments, uh, and which means that we're gonna to have to create ownership, ownership of, 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 of opportunities, ownership of entrepreneurship, ownership of, of uh, wealth, those kind of things. And we have to make sure that that neighborhood is the beneficiary of it, not just a source of somebody else's wealth. Because you can take a neighborhood or take a development in a neighborhood, and, and that it may be a great development, but, but that becomes the source of wealth for someone else, 
it, 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 there's not a direct benefit or even an indirect benefit sometimes. So what we want to do is ensure that when we create wealth and it is wealth that is translated into that neighborhood and that everyone is able to participate in. That's why we do community benefits agreement and those things, the policy that we've had and why the Greater Cleveland Partnership has adopted that approach in order for us to be able to uh, uh, create prosperity, create wealth, but have a better assurance that, that, that everyone, particularly the area in which these dollars are invested, uh, are able to uh, prosper from. And it's not just a job, it's, a, it's the business side of it too. Because if you got the business side, you can give the job. So you need, you need both, you need the business side, you need uh, uh, someone who can perform the work that is being created by the business opportunity. So it's a, it's a holistic approach. I will take that as an opportunity to transition into kind of underneath all of these aspirations mm -hmm. and challenges and successes is a, pre a presumption of public safety. Right. And obviously one of the challenges uh, that we are now facing, and um, Paul mentioned it, you mentioned it, is um, Department of Justice mm -hmm. and the status of the Cleveland Police Department. You have said that in some ways um, the coverage doesn't necessarily capture your full intention or your commitment, that you were uh, welcome the Department of Justice, that you, in advance of their findings, made it clear that the city was prepared um, to negotiate a consent decree, and that there has been, we've probably all heard about it, read about it, seen things about it, you got a room full of a thousand people. This is your chance to frame for us. How do you want us to think about uh, this situation with the Cleveland Police and the Department mm -hmm. of Justice, what we intend to do about it, and how you want us to understand your intentions and, and, and how we're going to respond. Okay. Well, first of all, we should look at it as not uh, something unwanted. Uh, it is the greatest opportunity we're going to have to make uh, substantial changes in a short period of time. You know, we've been working uh, since I've been mayor on things that to address uh, excessive force and stuff, but it is always incremental. It's incremental, and as you know, um, timing is everything. And, and now what we have, we have the greatest opportunity as, not only as a city, but as a community, as individuals, to make the greatest reform and changes that will ensure that policing in Cleveland will be one that is professional, with respect, and, and, and has at its core service, service. And, and that's where we are, we have that opportunity. Um, where we fall short, uh, I think, as we get, uh, and I don't think this is just uh, something about uh, Department of Justice and City Clean, I think this is a general notion, where we tend to fall short where we recognize challenges and we want to address those challenges is that we sometimes we, uh, in order to get past the moment, sometimes we want to do the quick fix. And, 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 and uh, the quick fix is nice for the moment, but it, it has no, it's not sustainable. And it does not really change anything, it just gives the appearance of. So what my position is, and the city's position, and I do believe uh, uh, the Department of Justice, at least on the local level, is, is that we want to have uh, a substantive change. We want to have real reform, and, and that reform has to be substantive. It just can't be, give, I'll, give me the tool, and then I'll brag about I, I got the tool, and, and all of a sudden, because we have the tool, now we're successful. No, you have to be able to use the tool. The craftsman, and whether it's not a good craftsman, is how you use the tool. So what we would like is a substantive reform, and identify what is that reform, and it has to be substantive has to be substantive, and then it has to be sustainable. It has to be sustainable, and that means that it can't be just a quick fix. It has to be something of substance that will sustain itself over a period of time, which means complete reform. Then we have to institutionalize it so it doesn't have to have a mayor or, or, or a, a department of justice or council or a particular chief or whatever in order for it to function this way. It, it should be institutionalized. This is the way we behave. This is what we do in Cleveland. We should be the model. 
as to what we do and how we do it. And it has to be professional, with respect, and have it as core service. How do we serve? Now, in doing that, uh, uh, you negotiate. You negotiate. You, you, you have to identify what that reform is. Then you back in what tools you need in order to accomplish that reform. And then you put a price tag on it. Now, if we just deal with the tool without it having any context of where it fits into how it's to be used to gain what, then we will spend a lot of money and we won't get anything for it. So for me, uh, it is about identification of what is that reform. What do we have to do in order to make that structural reform? And what tools do we have to have to do that? And what policy changes do we have to make in order to accomplish that? And then, you, and then what does it cost us to do that? And you budget it. So to me, that is um, uh, the approach that I'm taking and I believe is a responsible approach. Now, it may not be the most politically convenient approach to take. Uh, it, it may not be the most popular approach to take. But I'm not doing this uh, to ingratiate myself to anybody or, or, to, uh, or to be popular as a result of it. I'm doing this to actually have reform. We have identified something. Now it is our opportunity to do something about it and do something about it in a major substantive way. And I'm not gonna blow that opportunity by just trying to get past the moment or to placate uh, 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 this group or that group or to appear to uh, be doing something when in fact I'm not. I'm just not going to do that. I am going to take my time. I am going to lock down on this and we are going to have reform. We're going to have reform and that reform when we reach an agreement with the Department of Justice will be substantive, will be substantive, it will be something that, and, and, and that will be structurally changed to the point that it is sustainable over a period of time, and it will have at its base uh, uh, service that will be the core. Now, will it be easy? No. But if it was easy, somebody else would do it, I guess. Uh, so I'm not looking to get past the moment. I'm, I'm here on the long haul on this one, uh, because um, I know that it's a distraction and, and it's taken away from a lot of stuff. I know that there are people, particularly in the uh, uh, business community, who are concerned about the image of Cleveland and, and how Cleveland is being portrayed throughout the nation and throughout the world. Uh, and, and they have a right to be, because you know when you've been in the desert for a long time and, and, and people have uh, now come out of the wilderness, so to speak, and, and now they see these things happening, and, and they've been waiting on it, uh, they don't want to see it go away, and neither do I. But I'm not going to be expedient in regards to it and sacrifice substance, sacrifice quality, sustainability. I'm not going to sacrifice. So we're going to do what we need to do. And then finally, uh, I know that there are community groups, uh, uh, most of whom are sincere, most of whom, uh, uh, who again, just like the business community who sees um, the city finally moving in a direction and finally moving in the direction that is good for the pe them and they can see how this is going to translate into a broader quality of life and project. They, you know, community groups see the same thing. But they have been um, uh, so much out of the loop in terms of somebody hearing what they say that it, now it's time for the, is difficult for them to translate that conversation into action. And so that's where you need the partnership. You really do need a, a real community partnership. As I said before, anytime we've done things as a community, we've always been successful. And not only have we been successful, we have been success, successful in an exemplary way, in a great way. And this is no different. If we gravitate into our own organizational self-interest, if we gravitate into whatever our political considerations are, 
if we gravitate into the exploitation of the situation to benefit the individual or the group or the institution, whether it's financially or otherwise, or position them for power and authority. If we gravitate into that, we are going to fail. We're going to fail, I'm telling you that now. But if we come together as a community and recognize in full disclosure a need and are willing to get past ourselves and get past those impediments that we have created for success, and we work together as we work together on education, as we work together on community benefits, uh, this, is, uh, this is a growing experience, ladies and gentlemen. We're, we grow, and, 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 and you know, I I've, I've, uh, apologize for this, but I was, um, someone asked me about, you know, Mayor, uh, these are difficult times for you, you know, you got a lot of challenges. I, I say that hard times is what I do. I do hard times. And, and so, um, and, and, and I, I'll tell you that um, uh, uh, other than other than um, uh, me remembering when, because I had great parents and a, and a loving family, and, and they kind of protected and shielded me. So I had a moment, I had moments of innocence. You, know, you ever remember that? <laughs> moments that they, you know. So I can remember moments of innocence. But other than that, I don't remember easy times. My life has not been one of easy time. So this challenge to me is a major challenge, but it is what we do as a city. Cleveland is used to hard times. Hard times is what we do. We have not come through this. No one has given us anything. We've worked for it. We've actually taken it from people, like the RNC, the gay games, the senior games. They didn't just come here and say, here's a gift to you, Cleveland. We competed for these things. We won these things. And we were successful on these things because we operated as a community and we put aside our own individual self-interest or institutional organizational self-interest for the benefit of the whole. And what we did, anybody who wanted to exploit those situations for their own personal benefit or for their organizational benefit, we ostracized them, said, no, that ain't, this ain't that kind of party. You can't play here. <laughs> and so what I'm saying to people, yes, this is difficult, but hard times is what I do and hard times is what you do. And we will mature as a result of this. We will grow as a result of this. We will, our identity is in, in, in who we are as, as a people, what our personality is, what our character is, is what's called to question today, ladies and gentlemen, with this thing. That's what's called to question. And so we have to step up as to who we are. What is our character? What is our personality? Who are we? As, a, as, a, as individuals, who, is, who are we as corporations, as philanthropic? Who are we as, as organizations? Who are we as individuals? Who are we as a people? And I say to you, if we do this right, we will be recognized beyond the challenges and images that may be created today. We will be recognized as a great city because we would have done it for the people. But we have to put the work in. It ain't going to happen because you wish it. it. This stuff don't happen because you wish it to happen. This is work. This is work. You get, we have to put the work in. And if in putting that work in, we become exploitive of that moment, then that will tell us of who we are as a people, who we are as a city, and I don't think that, that that will be a good image. As a matter of fact, it won't be a good image, and I and you will not want to be part of that. Well, you have a group of people who, um, like you said, I think we've hit the highlights on a variety of issues, and I think your voice on that topic was something we've all been wanting to hear, this notion of we're going to own it, that we're going to act with urgency but not necessarily expedience, and that we will make progress. 
But I think to really make this a community dialogue about the state of our city, I'm going to go ahead and I'm getting the nod that it's time to uh, go ahead and welcome questions from the audience and hear what's on their mind. I could go on all day, but I think it's important to allow um, and, and engage in the dialogue with the mayor. Thank you, Beth. Today we are listening to the annual State of the City Address with Mayor Frank Jackson in conversation with Beth Mooney, Chair of the Greater Cleveland Partnership. We will return, as Beth noted, to Mayor Jackson in a moment for our traditional City Club question and answer period. We'd ask you to start formulating your questions now and please try to keep them brief and to the point and actually structured as questions. If you would like to ask a question, please form a line up front. There are gonna be two mics set up here. So please form a line behind one of the mics. Please be sure to tune into our City Club Friday forums on 90.3 WCPN, WVIZ PBS, 104.9 WCLV Idea Stream, or one of the many radio stations across the region and country that carry City Club programs. Television broadcasts of the City Club are made possible by Cleveland State University and PNC. This Friday, March 6th, at noon, the City Club will welcome Evan Wolfson, founder and president of Freedom to Marry, for a discussion on the historical, political, and social evolution of marriage equality in the United States. For more information about our upcoming and past forums, please visit us online at cityclub.org. We are very pleased to have sponsorship for today's forum from AT&T and the Sister of Charity Health System. With us today from AT&T are Mylena Albright, Vice President of External Affairs, and Adam Grisbicki, AT&T State President. And joining us from the Sisters of Charity Health System are Sister Judith Ann Kareem, CSA, Congressional Leader for the Sisters of Charity St. Augustine, and Melissa Rogers, Senior Vice President and Chief Financial Officer for the Sisters of Charity Health System, would you all please stand and be recognized for your support. Thank you very much. Today's forum is the annual Richard and Sally Hollington Endowed Forum, made possible by a special gift from Mr. and Mrs. Hollington to the City Club Forum Foundation. Joining us today are Richard and Sally Hollington, and I'd ask you to please stand and be recognized. And thank you for your support. We also welcome guests at tables hosted by many community organizations that are listed in the program. And again, we thank all of you for your strong support here. Now we would like to, as promised, return to Mayor Jackson for our traditional city and club question and answer period. We welcome questions from everyone, members and guests, and everyone who's here with us today. Again, as I noted, if you have a question, please move to the microphones in front of the room. And first question, please. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor. I appreciate your comments this afternoon. Um, as the leader of the Cleveland Metropolitan School District, um, there is a very controversial test that is going on in this district in the, in the country. It's a part of the Common Core curriculum. It's called the, right. park, the PARK test. And there's a growing movement. More and more parents are opting to take their students out of taking this test because the test is very uh, problematic. Uh, the computers aren't ready, uh, the test, uh, questions are confusing, and especially for the younger children, it's very, very devastating uh, just to take the test. Right. So my question to you is, um, has Superintendent Eric Gordon talked to you about the problems with the park test, and have we had any Cleveland parents who have opted out uh, of having their students take the test? Uh, I don't know if any clean parents have opted out. Uh, the superintendent, of course, has made me aware of, of, of the challenges. But this is a perfect example of, of tool versus substance. Uh, because I believe and I support a common core approach. You know, the devil's in the detail, right? And because what a common core approach in theory says is that <coughs> is that if I, my A here is my A there, is a common kind of curriculum, is a common approach, and, and is a standard, it is much higher standard because our children perform much better when our expectation of them is better. And, and because they're very intelligent. 
very intelligent. Their life experience has given them the ability to, to figure things out in a way that somebody who hadn't had their life experience wouldn't be able to figure it out. So they're very intelligent. And so I support the common core notion that we should have a common standard by which we should have all of our children achieving. And that standard should be high. Now that's a, as you know, that's a general theory, right? What has happened is, is rather than having a, a holistic and a, and a progressive process in getting there, what they do is they just use one tool. And they take this tool and, they, and because they have the tool, they, they, they are saying that I got this tool and this tool then is celebrated as success rather than the goal that they're attempting to achieve. So in that way, there needs to be a matching up of this stuff and there needs to be a staging of things so that you can have it, those tools be better used and be a better indicator of what you want to accomplish, if that answers your question. Because uh, to me, it's a perfect example of just focusing on the tool and think because we have a tool, then we can just forget about how does that tool interact with everything else and, and, and how, does that, how is that tool used? Because we don't want to use a tool that basically discourages people. We don't want to use it that way. So if we find that that tool is having that effect, then what do we do with that tool? How do we then adjust that tool in order, that's why you have to have the reform that you want, and you have to have the substantive side of that that is sustainable. And if you don't match up tool, available tools with the ability to achieve the outcome, you're going, all you have is a great conversation, then a couple of years from now, they'll come up with another tool. So if we want this to be substantive, if we want it to have real reform and, and sustainable and really institutionalized, we have to evaluate these things as we go. And if what we think they would do is not what they're doing, then we have to adjust accordingly. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor. My name is Attorney Joseph Meisner. My question is in line with some questions I've asked you before about immigration. Mm -hmm. President Obama has issued an executive order which could make up to five million people now illegally here legal. Right. These people, we understand, are productive, they pay taxes, they have deep ties to our country. It would seem like these are the people that we would want to attract to Cleveland to help repopulate our city. My question. What can our city of Cleveland do to attract such people as these and other immigrants that could help our city? Thank well, you. Well, you, you, have, you have two, uh, I, I look at it as two, uh, at least two categories. One is uh, in what I believe that we've done and we, and we need to adjust because again, you have tools and, and when those tools aren't working properly, you have to figure out a way. And what we've done is we've focused on those who we want to have immigrate to the city of Cleveland, but these are people who have choices. They have choices, they can be anywhere they want to be. But because um, they're in demand and we have uh, institutions like healthcare, uh, we have corporations and, 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 and we have certain things that Cleveland becomes a great choice for them. So we're already for that group we're already doing significant uh, uh, strides in attracting that type of immigrant to come to Cleveland because we can compete in that way, all right? Um, where we are falling short, in my opinion, is in the refugee area, where these are people who don't necessarily have choices. And they're running from something, whether it's economic, social, political. And, to, and the question to me is, how do we create an infrastructure that will bring them in, have them welcome, and then support them while they're here? Now, I, you know, one of the things that um, we have this uh, newcomer school, I think it's Jefferson, newcomer school uh, on the west side, multiple languages are spoken in that school, 
and, and, and the children who go there are children generally of refugees or people who have migrated from another part of the, of the country. And, and I had been talking to Councilman Semperman and talking to uh, Superintendent Gordon, and they're uh, looking at how do we create almost like a village and have that, that school be the centerpiece of that village where it becomes a place where, uh, 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 of, of security, where people can come there uh, and, and um, live there, the children get educated there, all those kind of things. Now, is that sufficient for us to be successful in immigration? No. So there's a, there are many other things that, as I know, Global Key Cleveland uh, purpose, and, it, and it's uh, and the reason why we put significant money into it and many other uh, uh, corporate and, and, and philanthropic groups put significant money in it is to help us in that in helping us be a welcoming city, in helping us to promote the city in terms of those who have choice so that they choose the city of Cleveland and, and then have to do a better job in creating infrastructure for those who may be refugees and, and welcome them and have an infrastructure that will allow them to come into the system. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. C. Thank you for your continued commitment to our city here. On March the 2nd, you, hold, you held a press conference at which you apologized to the family of Tamir Rice and to the citizens of Cleveland. Subsequent to that press conference, Mrs. Rice, Tamir's mother, accepted your apology as one of the citizens you apologize to, and on behalf of many of the other citizens of Cleveland, we too accept your apology and appreciate the genuineness which, which that apology was offered. Thank you. Well, thank I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor. I come not as a questioner, but to comment and thank you for being the person that you are, the man, the hard worker, and letting others know because out of them 300 and some odd thousands of folks that live in Cleveland, you see them when they want to raise saints. I want them to see you when you're trying to tell them what the realness of your job is. So I thank you and I appreciate you for you. being who you are. Keep up the hard work. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Good afternoon. Protocol has been established and greetings to you, Mayor Jackson, your wife and your children who have been patient as you have been our mayor for our city. Thank you, I know they'll appreciate that too. God bless you. My name is Reverend Pamela M. Pinckney Butts and I have been doing a new thing. Um, I wrote a speech for Congresswoman Stephanie Tubbs Jones and I've been doing a new thing and I am an apostolate, a female apostle. One of my, I have also entered into the uh, presidential campaign for the election for 2016 to run this nation. I'd like to see some things very differently done. And I would like to say to you, as you were addressing the, uh, the academia, one of my key concerns is that pens, paper, and prayer have been replaced with pistols, metal detectors, and pledges. And I am very concerned about that. And it's not only in Cleveland, it's all over the globe and it prepares us for more war and rumors of war. I know personally that all things work together for the good, for those who love God, who are the called according to his purpose. I do not blame you for the death of Tamir Rice. My question to you is, my being a woman in a position of leadership, <coughs> I, 
I would like for you to answer for all of us, what else you are doing, tell us what else you are doing to show the fact the, of the great respect that you have towards women in positions of leadership. I see you have appointed many women in positions of leadership and you do value our lives and not as property. And you do value us, not that we need your permission because you're a man, but you see who we are and you enjoy and you bless us with your respect for us to take us to the next right, thank level. Thank you, Ms. Payton, now I'll answer your question. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. You know, when I was uh, a kid, I was in, when I was in elementary, junior high, senior high, uh, the girls were always smarter than me. And they were generally smarter than most of the boys, almost all of us. And, and, um, and so I've always had uh, a respect for the intelligence of women. I was never misled by uh, those who would think that uh, otherwise. So, um, so I never developed that, that attitude that women could not do something. And, and as a matter of fact, in the community uh, that I was born in and raised, um, you know, we had um, families with a mother and a father, and then, uh, you know, the extended family, grandparents, and then you had the families where you did not have um, the father there. And I will tell you, um, some of the strongest people who kept uh, the neighborhood that I was born and raised in and still live in together were women, were women. So uh, I recognized uh, uh, intelligence, I recognized the strength, I recognized the talent, and I also recognized uh, the loyalty uh, that comes from uh, women who just want to have an opportunity and, and want to do it and do it right. And, and as a result of that, I've, I have uh, women in, in key positions in my cabinet. And I delegate tremendous authority and, and power to them. And, and I will tell you that uh, I've not been let down yet. So I uh, appreciate what you said, ma'am. But uh, it is, uh, is how do you recognize talent? And how do we get out of the stereotype of who is who and what is what? and really um, look at individuals as who they are and, and what they're capable of doing and how they fit into the overall success of any organization, uh, whether they're men, they're women, they're black, they're white, they're Hispanic, uh, gay, straight, no matter what it is, uh, if we're gonna be successful, we have to recognize people who, who they are, what they are, and, and, and what uh, contribution do they make towards the success of whatever it is that we have and the success of, in this case, the city of Cleveland. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor. Yes. My name is Zacchaeus Knight. I'm a senior at the Ginn Academy. And getting ready to leave for college, I would like to know what tools do you think should be installed inside of our high schools to make us more college ready, ready to graduate and ready to stay in college to all four years? Well, you know, that, that also goes back to the first question that was asked about the test and the, and the Common Core. Um, uh, we have to educate our, our children to a level where they're competitive. That is the whole purpose of the Cleveland Plan and why we adopt a, a portfolio model to accept quality education, whether it's charter, public, private, or parochial. So you have, we first have to adopt quality. And what uh, this um, Common Core is, is a raising of the standards, so that, and, and, and it's a Common Core, so everybody's measured by the same stick. Now that really it, uh, helps some people, it doesn't help others, right? Then inside the system, I think our school system now not only deals with Ohio graduation type of tests, but it also tests to uh, ACT or SAT. And as you know, if the higher score you get in that, then the more uh, colleges will be looking at you, the more money you have for scholarships, all that kind of stuff. And, and as a matter of fact, if you don't score high enough, you pretty much are eliminated from most 
of schools of higher learning. So what we're attempting to do is raise quality and, and, and raise expectation that others have of our children because uh, our children will meet the expectation. They'll meet it and they'll exceed it. So we have to raise that expectation uh, and that's why I support Common Core that has a higher expectation for systems and, and then has a common measuring tool. And then within the system, uh, we need to be testing in, in a way, not only uh, in a traditional way to, to find out where we are in academic in this subject matter, but also are we able to compete in a college world? And that goes to SAT, ACT, all that kind of stuff. So those are things that we're uh, looking at. Now, finally, um, I find that uh, arts and culture are, are one of the greatest tools you can use for young people or even adults who are having challenges, uh, whether in life or, or, or academically. And I've, I've seen uh, children uh, who were not doing well in school, but, for, but they became involved in some art form and as a result of that, they do extremely better. I think it has to do with, uh, with the fact that they can express themselves, they're free. And, and so all those things that become impediments to learning, all those things that become challenges to doing well academically, uh, uh, tend to go away because they're free to do whatever it is, whether it's through singing, acting, writing, painting, all those kinds of things. So I believe that having a robust uh, um, arts and culture program within the system uh, goes a long way. Now the Cleveland system has the School of the Arts and then uh, uh, Dyke, which is the, before the School of the Art. Uh, those two schools are, uh, do great, uh, but, I, but it's not system-wide yet. And I do believe we need to have a more robust arts and culture approach to life that, that gives kids the ability to just be themselves, to, to uh, work out whatever um, challenges they may have in a positive way. Thank you. Well, Mayor, this has been a, a great conversation and an opportunity for you to share many important things uh, with all of us here today. You've had opportunities, we've had challenges, um, I think you uh, captured the sentiment well that um, not afraid of hard work, that's what you that's do. Uh, maybe it's a luxury, but why don't we close on one quick notion. What's that? The headline when you're done. It may be a luxury to think about it, but what do you hope it will capture for what you accomplish as your term and your tenure as mayor of Cleveland? Job well done. Job well done. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we have enjoyed the Mayor's 10th State of the City Address in conversation with Beth Mooney. Thank you, Mayor Jackson. Thank you, Beth. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your participation. This forum is now adjourned.